more than 4 billion people live across Asia. And we are telling their stories. In this edition, to slow the spread of COVID-19, many have been asked to stay home. But for slum dwellers in Philippines, home is no refuge. While in the Middle East, Syrians displaced by the war simply cannot wait to go home. Philippine President Rodrigo Duterte has declared a lockdown of the capital no, metro Manila. The recent is COVID-19 alert, the highest level, virus. during which the movement of everyone will be significantly limited. Nakadungog mi aning COVID ni ato pang February. Nya murag layo pa man kayo to kay gamay rang positive. Nya kasagaran gikan biyahe. On January 30th, Philippines recorded its first COVID-19 case in Manila. Unbeknownst to many, the virus would manifest a month later with over 100 cases spread across major cities. On March 16th, President Rodrigo Duterte locked down major cities like Cebu to curb the outbreak. Nahadlok ni pagkahibaw nga quarantine kay unsaon na lang among panginabuhi. Non-essential industries closed or implemented work-from-home programs. Public transportation was suspended, community events postponed. While many Filipinos could take necessary precautions, the urban poor could not. Christy Baho from Cebu is one of them. Ako mga anak direta nan opat. Ako mga igsoon diya sa babaw. Tulo ka buok. Wala sila trabaho. Ang akong mama na dito sa Manila na lockdown. Needy families were forced to stay home even if it meant being cramped together in spaces no larger than the standard bathroom. Pagdito sa ona taga dere na jud mi. Ya mo maigsuon, dagko na lang ni. Na Japan mi din hi. Ya kana among gipuyan din hi sa among balay, tagbaboy jud na siya sa una. Kaya kung iyaan, nagbuhi magbabuyan niya karon kami nalay ni Polik. Namo lang gibaligi tarong-tarong gamay. Kung gisiminto, anong tarong. Kita ganun, mananap. Around 20 million Filipinos live in slums, where they have to survive poor housing conditions, lack of sewage facilities, and little to no access to clean water. Grabe kalisod kay sa una makatrabaho man ko jutay laba-laba niya ako bana manika dito makakuanog 300 4 may na lang kay makasudan-sudan big mga manok ingana na siguro niya lisod suka ah, suka nakuaning coronavirus di ko kalaba-labag tarong niya di ko kay ko kalihok ang bisod jud nga adlo na mo gatam kuan walong wala jud ni oy Sobra ka walang wala para tong sus, wala dyan yung makaw ng mga anak. Sige dyan maglogaw, maingaw ng mga bata mo. Sige lang taglogaw, Ani. Local government units struggle to take care of thousands of families. Philip Zafra, a city councilor, headed relief operations in one of Cebu's main villages. Regardless of economic strata, everyone is affected on this. But as to the impact, so mo na ningo ng gobyerno nga katulang yung pinakalisod at tuntagan. We are also preparing to provide them the provisions, the basic necessities and essentials. Nagsaligra po ni sa ayuda sa barangay. May na lang po, at least na ibugas. Pero, horot na jud among sardinas. <laughs> Wala na kay misod ang jud. Ang pamagi na mo karoon kaya no? Da ginuton lang kung ano na mga dilata, na bugas, amoy guigoon sa mga bata, kay lisod po da mga bata way kaon. 
When desperate, Christy resorts to stealing vegetables from her neighbors. Although the government promised cash assistance for the needy, when we met Christy in April, she had not received any money, only relief goods that came weeks apart and in waves. But we know for a fact that the government cannot sustain the same if we will reach up to how? Five, six if months or one year. That's one thing that our uh, medical expert, we survey our economic team, should look into uh, more seriously and focus because unsa una to pag ingon tax sustain sa tong ekonomiya nga without risking the health of the people because we could not just be placed for so many months under ECQ under the enhanced community quarantine or ECQ each household had one quarantine pass enabling one family member to go out for essential goods and services Residents found outside without a valid reason could be fined, jailed, or made to do community service. Kung madakpan sa tanod, madakpan sa police, then we have to really put them on on cell. Pero kung dili ang ogi buhat atong gi encourage ang atong citizenry to take pictures of them, then ako ng ipost sa ako ng FB. Haran said makole lang attention. At the same time, marumawaw sa sila gamay. But for some urban poor, they'd rather get fined, arrested, or shamed online than stay hungry or cooped up in homes that become furnaces during humid summers where temperatures can hit 41 degrees Celsius. Maglisod mi kay walay tarong nga supply sa tubig. Gamay among balay, sikit-sikit pa jud mi. Unsaon man na nga kinahanglan man mi mugaos para na ami makaon. Wala pod mi mapalitan og face mask diri. During the lockdown, surgical masks and sanitizers were severely in lack, even in hospitals and healthcare centers. And for people like Christy, these vital items were too expensive. This lack of protection worries experts, as they fear many cases are going undetected. So if there's no testing in a community, the no case just means that no one is detected as of now. So. I think that should put things into context, that we should be at a heightened alert. The Philippines has one of the highest COVID-19 mortality rates in Southeast Asia. Early detection could help curb the outbreak and prevent more deaths. So the government has set a goal to test 1% of the population, slightly more than a million people. In Cebu, Authorities are strategically testing at least 10% of the population, or 23,000 families. We would rather that we will conduct the testing on the densely populated areas. Katong walay fence nga balay, no? Katong sikit ng mga balay, kay kana may lisod ka ayo na to nga i-address. If si Mako na positive on a well-off area, subdivision perhaps, mas makontain man na to. Slum areas really are a big problem. We are actually expecting it to increase once we expand testing. But good thing now is that um, the local government unit of Cebu and other cities are are admitting to that particular reality. And we're they're actually looking for sites that we can convert into isolation facilities or temporary treatment and monitoring facilities. Samples are taken, but results have been delayed, as the labs have not been able to keep up. And for the low income, getting tested is a risk. Admittedly, the um, idea of healthcare is healthcare consultation equals cost. The health has already issued a particular package for COVID-19 cases, be it moderate, severe, or uh, mild cases. So not something uh, should be take the anxiety of our urban poor communities if they eventually become sick. But many are still not assured. Phil Health, the national health insurer, previously bore the full cost of COVID-19 treatment. Then in mid-April, they announced that only subsidies will be given. That's not the only sign that Philippines' healthcare system 
is straining under the weight of the pandemic. I am Dr. Vico Angelo de Leon. I am an anesthesiologist. I am the one responsible for intubating critically ill patients, COVID-19 infected patients. This process of intubation is a life-saving procedure. However, it is so risky in such a way that it would create um, aerosols or droplets that put us at risk of uh, getting infected with that disease. According to the World Health Organization, in the Western Pacific region, the Philippines has one of the highest number of medical staff infected by COVID-19. We have uh, what they call the supply of those uh, resources and, and PPEs, but um, those supply we get runs out and to our, and sometimes we resort to reusing them you know, in uh, in the front lines. We're trying our best to combat um, these uh, deficiencies by procuring enough supplies and through uh, some donations from from our donors. Philippines has uh, one of the highest uh, number of medical staff uh, infected with COVID, maybe because of the enormously number of uh, patients coming in. And that um, though there are protocols stated, but uh, mostly they are due to uncooperative patients during history taking. Patients have been known to lie about their travel history and medical conditions out of fear of being shamed for having COVID-19. I encourage everyone to do their part by staying at home while we are battling this virus, while we are on the front lines. The message to Filipinos is clear. Stay at home to stay out of hospital. As simple as it sounds, it remains a feat for people like Christy. Nga maglisod mi pangita og trabaho, nya way sigurado among kwarta, di pud pa igo ang hinabang sa gobyerno, wala kadawatanan unsaon kaha ang pag-eskwela sa mga bata, di wan pud taganahan nga matakdan sila og masakit. The strict lockdown was lifted on June 1st and quarantine measures have eased to revive the economy. Industries like manufacturing, retail, food and beverages and others are operating with health protocols in place. But the government has not reached their goal of testing 1% of the population and there are concerns about undetected cases. Community quarantine, home isolation, hand washing, work from home options, um, these things are helping. If you relax too early, you could see the transmission going to our vulnerable group. Could Christy and her family, living hand to mouth meant the daily hustle was their only means of survival. The pandemic has made their difficult lives even harder. But she has not lost hope. Up next, Syrians who sought refuge in Turkey for years are finally going home. Turkey's poorest 820-kilometer border with Syria has been a lifeline for millions of people fleeing the violence and persecutions of war. According to the Turkish government, the country has been hosting some 3.6 million Syrian refugees at the cost of over 40 billion U.S. dollars. Only a fraction of them live in government-run camps, 
the majority have chosen to carve out a life for themselves in the bigger cities where more economic opportunities can be found. Yaya Omar Shugur and his two kids arrived in Turkey in 2016 after fleeing bombardments in northwest Syria that killed members of his extended family. The smuggler charged them $500 each to take them from Azaz, Syria, across the border where he left them. Yahya's wife joined them two months later. They made their way to Istanbul and moved into this rented apartment in the neighborhood of Esenyurt. Yaya works construction jobs while his kids attend a local school. They have all learnt the Turkish language, but after many years, Yaya says it's now time to go home. However, now some Syrians are beginning to feel it's safe enough to return home following Turkey's military operations in the north of the country to rid the border region of what they consider terrorist elements. Turkey is now helping those Syrians, just like Yahya, return. After years here, many have built lives for themselves in Turkey, but it's not home. It'll be a long night of goodbyes. Tomorrow, Yahya and his family will start the 1,200-kilometer bus journey from Istanbul to the border for what they hope will be a reunion with their old lives. It's a morning full of mixed emotions. With bags packed, Yahya's family leave the house they've called home since 2016. <laughs> The Istanbul municipality of Esenyurt has arranged to take Yahya's family and another family of six back to Syria. Altı sene önce terörden kaçarken bir çocuktu. Şimdi genç delikanlı olmuş. Biz de zaten hanım ve çocuk ağırlıklı bir nüfusa ev sahipliği yapıyoruz. Zaten beyleri, babaları bunların savaşta ya kaybetmiş orada ölmüşler ya da orada savaşıyorlar. Şu anda dönüyorlar çünkü huzur geldi. Yani siz bir kuşu kafeste tutsanız bile o özgür olmak istiyor. Şimdi burası, biz burada çok iyi misafirperverlik ediyoruz. Bunları iyi burada karşılıyoruz ama bunların da vatanı var. There have been accusations that some refugees have been forced to return, so everyone is asked to sign papers of consent. Thousands of refugees from northern Syria have returned home since 2016. Many others have nothing to return to, so have chosen to stay in the lives they have built for themselves in Turkey. <laughs> Saying goodbye is not easy for anyone. <laughs>
Yahya's son was eight when he arrived in Turkey and remembers his life back in Syria well. Another family, Mohammed, his wife and five children, have dreamed of returning to Syria ever since they fled to Turkey in 2015. So we've been on the bus now for about six hours. We've just left the Turkish capital, Ankara, and we still have at least another eight or nine hours ahead of us. Yet despite that, uh, spirits still seem to be high on the bus. These families, however, have not been back in Syria in over three years. They haven't seen their families. They haven't seen their homes. Uh, and of course, a lot has changed in the country during that time. So there is sort of mounting anxiety about what they're going to find when they do finally cross the border. Yahya's house was completely destroyed by what he says was a rocket from the government side, while Mohammed doesn't know what's become of his house and family in Aleppo. بدي ارجع على سوريا يعني اهلي هنيك ابوي موجود وامي موجوده ابوي مرضون يعني والله يعني كل مره تليفون انه هي ما بدها تنزل هي ما بدها تنزل ان شاء الله هالكم يوم هالكم شهر ما بدك شو يعني انسان غايب عن بلده ثلاث سنوات يعني بشوف شيء جديد بشوف شيء متغير يعني Lots has changed in Syria. Homes have been destroyed, lives have been lost, and in pockets of the country, the war rages on. The sun has just risen over the Turkish border town of Kilis, the last stop in Turkey before entering Syria. This is as far as the Istanbul municipality officials can go. From here, Turkey's Disaster and Emergency Management, or AFAD, will take everyone across the border. AFAD have been actively helping restore Syrian cities and communities in the area. In Aziz, in Elbab, in, in Errai, in Jarablus, now the hospitals are serving for the people. The schools are repaired, the mosques are repaired. Bags are transferred and papers rechecked. The kids get more toys and donations are offered to the families, unsure of what awaits them on the other side. Emotions are tempestuous, filled with excitement and anxiety as we approach the Onjupunar border crossing. The bus erupts into song as we finally enter Syria. This is the first time both families have been in the war-torn country in over three years. Yahya calls his family immediately to tell them he is home. We drive through the run-down streets of Azaz in Syria's northwest, which has seen a good share of the war as the Syrian government and its allies fight U.S. and Turkish-backed rebels, while terrorist groups flourish within the power vacuum. While the entire cost of the devastation will take years still to calculate, the United Nations estimates rebuilding the country will run upwards of 250 billion U.S. dollars, about four times Syria's pre-war GDP. We arrive at the main bus station in the town of Azaz. It is here that Yahya is finally reunited with waiting family members. However, it will take longer for Mohammed and his family to reach home. 
نروح على حلب مباشر حلب ما في لبكرة خليهم معك خليهم معك بكرة الساعة 6 الصبح بكرة الساعة 6 الصبح حلب لأني طريق 13 ساعة so we've come to the main bus station in the town of Azaz. All this milling around is trying to figure out if there is uh, some sort of transportation that can take the two families to the town or to the city uh, of Aleppo. There doesn't seem to be at this time. So what they're going to do uh, is go to a relative of one of the families uh, who lives nearby and uh, spend the night there until tomorrow. They hope uh, they can find some form of transportation to Aleppo. Everyone clamors back onto the bus and heads to Yahya's brother's house, where all the extended family are waiting. A soldier with the Free Syrian Army stands guard while we are present, reminding everyone that the war in Syria is far from over. When Yahya and his family fled Syria in 2016, he didn't know when or if he'd ever see his brothers again. Yahya proudly introduces his extended family. However, sadly, not everyone is here. He lost two of his cousins in the war. But there has also been happiness in the time he's been away. Yahya is introduced to his new niece, while the other children poke inside all the bags for any possible gifts. <laughs> While more than 5.6 million Syrians have fled to neighboring countries, a further 6.5 million have moved around Syria itself to escape the violence. One of Yahya's brothers, Zakaria, and his six children have also recently returned to Azaz after many years away as part of Syria's internally displaced population. Zakaria's son is 21 years old. Mohammed and his family will make the one-hour journey to their home in Aleppo in the morning, while Yahya will stay in his brother's home in Azaz, while he can build or buy a new one for his own family. These two families know there are still difficult times ahead. They may be back in their own country, but with Syria's civil war still raging on, life as they once knew it, here at home, may never be the same again. Natalie Carney, CGTN, Azaz, Syria. Follow us on social media to contribute stories or share your thoughts.